Welcome to the I Can Do Anything podcast. My name is Colin. Today I'm going to be talking about basketball. I'm going to be talking about a couple other random things because this is the I Can Do Anything podcast. Selling tickets should be easy so you can focus on what truly matters, your production. The I Can Do Anything podcast is powered by Ludus, built from the ground up for a high school theater director. Ludus is simple and free online ticket sales for K-12 through schools with a customized ticketing portal. Ludus offers great customization features. Choose your own unique domain. Pick custom colors to match your organization, build a meaningful splash page, take control of your ticket sales, add shows and showtimes, search for tickets, find patron data in seconds, create multiple admin users and issue exchanges and refunds at the click of a button. One of the best features Ludus has to offer is the ability to generate detailed reports, view revenue data broken down by day, manipulate your data to answer questions about your sales, and export your data for future use. Ludus also offers powerful reserved seating. Easily let your patrons choose their own seats for your reserved seating shows. Upload your seating chart, add sections, rows, tables, choose premium seating, and general admission shows are possible too. You can keep track of student sales as well. Each student receives a Ludus account and a special sales code that can be applied to any order. When patrons purchase their tickets, they have the ability to print their tickets at home, have them digitally sent to their email for use on mobile devices, or mark them to be picked up at will call. With Ludus, customer service is a breeze. Oftentimes, it's nice to talk to a real person who understands what your job consists of. Ludus offers real-time support and has sold over 1 million tickets and over 350,000 tickets this year. Visit Ludus.com and start selling tickets tickets today with Ludus's forever 100% free guarantee to your program. That's Ludus.com, L-U-D-U-S.com. Okay, let's start the I Can Do Anything podcast today with Team USA and the FIBA World Cup. The United States uh, has left for China um, and has won each of the last five international tournaments at the senior level, three Olympics in 2008, 12, and 16, and two World Cups in 10 and 14, though they were undefeated throughout, finishing 42-0 and across those five competitions. The U.S. has had some close calls. The 2019 FIBA World Cup could mark the toughest challenge for the United States since they finished third at the 2006 World Championship, yet wielding the most talent from 1 to 12 on any roster the u.s remains the favorite uh, but depth isn't as critical in a single elimination scenario nor in a game that's only 40 minutes long the u.s lost to australia in a pre-tourney exhibition um, which served as a reminder that there uh, there exists a thin line between victory and defeat that before the americans even compete for a medal they could again face australia this time in the quarterfinals so uh I think the U.S. has now, well, they've narrowed their roster um, down to 12 teams or to 12 players. Um, so they depart for China with, uh, come on, just show me the roster. The 12-man roster for the tournament includes Walker, Turner, Mitchell, Tatum, Barnes, Brown, Harris, Lopez, Middleton, Plumley, Smart, and Derek White. So that knee injury that kept Kyle Kuzma out of that Australia game eventually led him to drop out of the roster uh, amongst a lot of other guys that dropped out of the roster. There were at least three rosters worth of American players who declined to play this summer or withdrew from consideration after an initial 20-man training camp roster that was announced in early June. Uh, So a 12-man roster... Um, there were three 12 man rosters worth of American players who are not on the team that were potential players um, with the majority of those guys being all stars and superstars in the NBA that have notably um, decided to not play in this World Cup. In fact, after that, the U.S. added 11 more players for consideration to get to that group of 31 to to a final 12-man roster for the World Cup. Uh, It only had to cut two players. The other 17 either suffered injuries or withdrew. Almost four weeks into the process, after the team's first practice in Shanghai, the players were still being asked questions about the stars who decided they weren't going to play. It doesn't matter, said Kemba Walker on Thursday. It's all about the guys who are here. We're the ones who are going to take on this challenge and do what we can to represent our country the best way that we can. Um, Those guys that are here uh, rank as solid players, but there's no question that the, the roster lacks star power. The U.S. team has just two players, Jalen 
Brown and Jason Tatum, who were drafted in the top five. Every other USA roster with NBA players since 1992 has had at least four top five picks. Just one player, Kemba Walker, who ever made an NBA... Oh, and it now only has one player, Kemba Walker, who has ever made an all-NBA team. He was on the third team this past season. The only players with senior-level national team experience are Mason Plumley and Harrison Barnes, who had minor roles on the 2014 and 2016 teams, respectively. But experience isn't as important as the ability to just get buckets when they're needed. The U.S. has Walker, Tatum, and Donovan Mitchell for that task. But those guys are a step below Durant, Harden, and Irving, who averaged, who scored at least 28 points Durant in three gold medal games. 26 points in 2014 gold medal game Kyrie Irving and 23 in that same game for Harden um so yeah they just don't have the star power but that is that's nothing new um Australia believes oh no uh though the Australia outcome uh blah 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 so, the U.S. will begin to play in Group E, playing games in Shanghai against the Czech Republic September 1st, Turkey September 3rd, and Japan September 5th. The top two teams from that pool will advance to the second round where they will join the top two teams from Group F, which consists of Brazil, Greece, Montenegro, and New Zealand to form Group K in Shenzhen, one of those four games. The two top teams from Group E will play one game apiece against the two games from Group F. will very likely feature the U.S. facing NBA MVP Giannis Antetokounmpo from Greece. That probably won't be an elimination game, but only two teams from Group K will advance to the quarterfinals. Eight groups of four, A through H, turn into four groups of four, I through L. And from those four groups, we get eight teams for the single elimination tournament that begins September 10 in Shanghai. The groups aren't all that balanced, though. You could argue that there are three teams in Group H, Australia, Canada, and Lithuania, better than any team in Group A. Argentina isn't nearly the team that it was several years ago, but it's likely the best team in Group A, B, and I. Together, the two teams that emerge from Group H, meanwhile, will have to compete with France out of Group G for two of the spots in the quarterfinals. Assuming that the U.S. advances out of Group K, its quarterfinal opponent will come from the Australia-France-Lithuania mix, so the Americans could have an elimination game against a medal-worthy opponent right away. If the favorite isn't the United States, it's Serbia, which went 10-0 and in its, in its exhibition slate, beating France, Greece, Italy twice, Lithuania twice, and Turkey. The Serbs were the silver medalists at the 2014 World Cup and 16 Olympics, and they now have an improved and more mature Nikola Jokic, though the tournament won't be the same without an injured Milos Tiodosic. Jokic is an is exhibit A of how most of the top talent on other teams is in the front line. France has Rudy Gobert, Australia has Aaron Baines, Andrew and, and Andrew Bogut, and then Spain has Mark Gasol and Lithuania has Sabonis and Valanciunas. That's going to be there's a video on NBA.com um, that that talks about that. That's going to be the U.S.'s biggest struggle is the front line. Uh, their front line. <laughs> isn't necessarily all that powerful and Jokic is certainly you know one of the best big men in the country or in the world um, and definitely in the NBA and we don't have one of the best big men <laughs> we by no means have one of the best big men or any of the best big men uh, in the NBA on this team USA roster the big men uh, on this team are Plumlee uh, I guess you could say Derek White sort of Brooke Lopez. Yeah, we're going to really, really struggle on the front line. If we lose games, that will be the reason. Um, it'll be because Jokic dominated. Rudy Gobert is not all that dominant. Neither are a lot of those other guys. Like like Brooke Lopez is, is this about the same level as as Sabonis and Valanchunas. Mark Gasol is, is a great big man. He will certainly present problems. Andrew Bogut will present problems. Aaron Bain is kind of a utility guy for the Celtics. I'm not sure where he's at anymore, but Rudy Gobert is mostly a defender and not necessarily known as like a prolific scorer or a 
prolific big man necessarily. He's pretty much uh, strictly a great rim protector um, and defender. So qualifying for Tokyo 2020, seven teams from the World Cup will qualify for the next two years Olympics in Tokyo. Oh, for next year's Olympics in Tokyo, but they're not necessarily the top seven finishers. The team that will qualify for the Olympics are the top finisher from Africa, the top two finishers from the Americas, the top finisher from Asia, the top two finishers from Europe, and the top finisher from Oceania. As the host, Japan is automatically qualified for the Olympics. The other four teams in the 12-team Olympic field will come from qualifying tournaments that will take place early next summer. That's not fair to Europe, which accounts for 12 of the 32 and probably six of the top eight teams in the World Cup field. But that's kind of just the way it works. So even for the U.S., um, even if the U.S. were to lose in the knockout rounds, it will almost surely qualify for the Olympics because it probably won't finish lower than the two other teams in the Americas. As noted above, Argentina has a very good chance of reaching the quarterfinals, but it will be difficult for any of the other five teams from the Americas, Brazil, Canada, and the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and Venezuela to break through. The Americans aren't here just to qualify for the Olympics, though. Ten new players on the roster means 10 guys who have never won gold a standard has been set and a loss no matter how many players declined to be here would be a huge disappointment that story was on nba.com from john schumann a senior stats analyst for nba.com um i'm excited to watch these games you know not because of the star power and not because of you know the reason that that we're used to uh being excited about watching team usa teams it's just going to be excited to see like exciting to see who steps up it'll be it'll be interesting to see uh kimba walker and donovan mitchell uh in leading roles kimba walker has always been a leader on his teams in the nba because he's always been far and away the best player on his team um but donovan mitchell i guess has been a leader in in utah but as a young guy uh, now going into next year, what will be his third year in the NBA. This will help him kind of emerge into uh, a leader, hopefully, for this Jazz team. He's going to have Mike Conley uh, to help him. I think Mike Conley is is more or less the leader of that new Jazz team, although he is a new guy. Um, so maybe just because he's a new guy, Donovan Mitchell will – I mean, you know, in terms of like, you know, NBA cities kind of embrace – guys that come to them via the draft think of Dwayne Wade and and Kemba Walker in in New Orleans and or in uh Charlotte Anthony Davis in New Orleans um you know like it just it'll be it'll I think Utah will still be considered Donovan Mitchell's team but more or less in the locker room uh Mike Conley will be the leader of that team and certainly probably um I don't know. It'll be interesting to see who who would, uh, who will be an all star from that Utah Jazz team. Um, so I want to move on to Boogie Cousins arrest warrant. Jeez, man. I mean, what a what a couple of weeks that Boogie's had. He injures his knee, or I guess it's been like a month or so since that happened. But he injures his knee. Shortly after that, gets married, um, and now there's an arrest warrant out for his arrest due to a domestic violence case that was brought up actually in relation in relation to uh his wedding uh alabama police have issued an arrest warrant for los angeles lakers demarcus cousins on a misdemeanor domestic violence charge for harassing communications the mobile municipal court website indicates a warrant was issued for harassing communications but does not list other details tmz released an audio recording tuesday in which it says cousins threatens to shoot Christy West, the mother of seven-year-old ch- of their seven-year-old child. Go shoot the ball. Go shoot the ball. No, he's not coming. Yikes. So yeah, that was in relation to uh, he wanted his son their seven-year-old son to be able to come to his wedding and and she was 
as you heard, not really uh, having it. I don't know whether or not he actually ended up going to the wedding. Um, but yeah, it'll just be interesting to see what happens from here on out with DeMarcus Cousins' future. I talked a little bit last episode just about his injury and, what, and you know how that would impact his future. But you know, with the money that he's got and having it just be like a communications harassment, you know, he did threaten her life you know, <laughs> by saying that he would put a bullet in her head. Um, so that's ser- certainly a serious thing. Uh, but, you know, he, he probably won't face any jail time for it. I'm sure it'll just be like a fine um, and maybe some sort of restraining order or something along those lines. But as, as a team now with DeMarcus Cousins, you know, past on the court and off the court antics now his and then his injury proneness is not a word with you know the injury history that he's got now and then this like man i don't know his one year contract with the lakers is going to expire and it'll be interesting to see what happens with demarcus cousins I, I sort of felt bad for him and now i really don't again <laughs> Um, probably not the smartest thing to do if you make millions of dollars and you're a public figure to threaten to put a bullet in your wife's or your baby mama's head. I don't know. Yeah. Not the greatest decision making from DeMarcus Cousins, but that's what we've come to expect sort of, uh, from DeMarcus Cousins. So let's move on to another big man from the NBA. There was a lot of back and forth between Kobe and Shaq uh, after Kobe was interviewed talking about Shaq's uh, lack of work ethic and how he could have won more championships had Shaq uh, not been so lazy. Shaq posted a funny picture of him dunking on like like three or four uh, New Jersey Nets players and said, damn, I was lazy as the caption or something like that. Uh, they're just being funny and playful, but you know, I almost kind of wonder whether or not it's actually fun and playful. Like they say that they say it's all good and that they're, that they have a good relationship and that it's all fun and games, but like, is it really, there's a certain point where it's like, are you just saying that just so it's so that it's so that the media doesn't make more of it. And so that, you know, you don't have to deal with the repercussions of this or are you actually, not really all that tight. I I tend to think that maybe this is a little more real uh, than they say that it is. Shaq kind of, Shaq's being funny by saying like, man, I was lazy posting a picture dunking on people. But like in reality, like Shaq, that's not the point. We all know that you were dominant and that you could dunk on three or four players at any given moment. That's not what Kobe's talking about. He he acknowledged your your supreme dominance and your supreme athleticism and physical gifts, which are what you exhibited in that picture on Instagram. But laziness has nothing to do with being able to dunk on three or four players. Laziness is getting in the gym to be in better shape. Laziness is working on your fundamentals and practice. Now you may not need the fundamentals and the, you know, the intricacies of, of, of the detail in post moves when you're Shaq and you can just bully people in the post and, and dunk over three or four guys. But, uh, you know, it probably certainly would have helped. I don't necessarily, uh, have much of an opinion on this matter uh, in either direction. Uh, I think Kobe exaggerated by saying he would have won 12 championships, probably wouldn't have won 12 championships. <laughs> um, but that's kind of obvious. I don't know. Um, I can't really think of the, the times that they didn't win championships, like who they lost to. I would have to go back into the history books, which I'm not going to do um, today, but they definitely would not have won 12 championships. Uh, Shaq probably would have gone down. I mean, they probably would have won two or three more. Maybe Shaq would have gone down. Yeah, I don't know who, uh, how can you even met like for Kobe to say that, like you can't fucking measure how lazy a guy was and like whether or not if he were to have put in X amount of more exertion, like how do you even measure somebody's try heartedness in a practice and what that would have led to, you know, so much of basketball is talent and skill and preparation, but there's a, there's a pretty large percentage of it that is also 
dumb luck and just like whether or not the other players were 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 prepared and 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 skilled and talented like you know whether or not Robert Ory misses a three or whether or not Tim Duncan misses a hook shot or misses two of the hook shots that he made you know like I don't know there's really no way to like history could have gone so many different ways you know based on injuries and based on fatigue and there's just no way to be able to tell you know whether or not a guy would have been considered the greatest of all time had he been a little bit less lazy i don't know it's just like it's just a funny thing for kobe to say in an interview to get like to be a soundbite um you know again whether or not he actually meant it or if he was just trying to be funny um and knew that Shaq would think it was funny and they could have a little back and forth and get their names in the media for a little bit um you know that's probably more or less what it was uh more centered around um let's move on to I want to move on to James Harden so as you know I listen to the flagrant two podcast weekly um I am a Andrew Schultz fanatic and by that, I mean, I don't like the word, I don't like the term Stan, but uh, Andrew Schultz, that's my guy. I, uh, he is kind of like gospel to me. Like I just, uh, I think that his, his thought process, um, his ability to find unique ideas and perspectives and the funny in unique situations is second to none and as good as anybody that's in podcasting and in the in the game of comedy and that's really what what comedy is it's kind of a in a lot of ways it's it's a game and so is just like you know everybody's got a podcast including myself you know some people listen to, uh, you know, some podcasts get a lot more listeners than others. <laughs> and there's just so many people that are, that are doing this that either don't have interesting things to say or do have interesting things to say or just say the same thing that everybody else is saying. And in my opinion, Andrew Schultz is one of the greatest that's doing it right now and him and akash on flagrant two had this really great uh sort of take that i want to elaborate on so james harden has been working on his his running one-footed three-pointer this year and says that he wants to when it's all said and done have his step back in this new patented whatever uh it's not patented, but this new running step backing one footed three point shot be his, you know, like signature move, kind of like Jordan had his signature fade away uh, from the corner or from the wing or whatever. So he wants to have this move that he's now working on and his step back that he's been, you know, has become famous over the last couple of years be his like signature thing that everybody remembers. But I like, so, so the, so Schultz and Akash were, were saying like, this is not the, what you need to be working on. James Harden has no, problem scoring points we saw that this past season but instead of in the off season playing practicing well you don't practice defense you just try harder on defense but instead of working on his i guess now that i'm saying it out loud it, it, the things that i want him to, to work on or to focus on more aren't necessarily things that you work on in the off season like passing <laughs> and just, I mean, he's a great playmaker in general. He, he, you know, finishes with, he probably averaged somewhere around eight and a half assists per game this past season, maybe a little lower or a little higher. Um, so there's no doubt that James Harden's a great playmaker, but scoring and working on new moves is not what you need to be doing in the off season. Scoring is clearly not your issue. Your issue is trying on fucking defense. Now, James Harden uh, was among the top players this year, among the league leaders in steals per game, but that's not the point. 
getting steals is only one portion of defense. Staying in front of your man is a big part of it. Helping out on defense on driving lanes is a big part. Coming over to help to block shots and 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 challenge shots at the rim is a big part of it. And a lot of his steals, I assume, were off ball steals and maybe a small percentage of them on ball steals. Uh, but the point is, is that James Harden is working on a one footed running three pointer this year in the off season, amongst all other things. Michael Jordan's patented fadeaway jump shot is what it is today, not because it was such a great shot. It, it, there's no doubt that it was a very unstoppable, amazing shot. Jordan has the turnaround, the fadeaway jump shot, and he's got the tongue that he's iconic for. But those two things are iconic things because he won six rings james harden the beard and the step back in this running one-footed jump shot aren't going to be iconic unless you get the first thing you've got to have the wins and the rings for those other two things to be iconic don't get me wrong the beard and this step back are always going to be things in nba history that people talk about because they're that James Harden is that good of a scorer. He's got that much of a brand now with the beard. And those step backs have uh, changed the way that refing in the NBA is looked at, changed the way that, um, you know, a lot of people now are shooting that. that st- I mean, the step back three isn't like necessarily a new thing. Um, but this like double fucking step back that James Harden does has certainly uh, brought up a lot of questions about whether or not it's a travel um, and just James Harden's ability to get to the free throw line. Um, you know, th- that step back in this new thing that he's working on are, are going to be talking points throughout NBA history, but they're not going to be iconic the way Jordan's tongue out while he's floating through the air are or were and his fadeaway jump shot were unless James Harden, you win the rings to go along with him. And it's not going to happen. James Harden is working on a one footed running three pointer in the off season instead of getting in better shape and doing defensive shuffles and cone drills where you're coming off a pick and roll and getting in traffic and working on, you know, uh, we're going to behind the back pass for God's sake. (laughs) Or I don't know. I don't know what the fuck you work on to become a better playmaker or a better defender. Those two things are just kind of mindsets, but it's just kind of an interesting thing. Um, that flagrant two brought up that I wanted to sort of build on. They didn't really mention whether that, that those two, that those things being an iconic, you know, patented move aren't iconic and patented unless you have the wins and the, the, the allure comes from winning. And then they say, uh, he won six championships and oh, he had that amazing fadeaway jump shot and he glided through the air with his tongue out and made it look so fucking easy. So they're not going to say the same things about James Harden. It's going to be, at the end, it's going to be, he had the fucking step back thing and he had the fucking beard, but he never got past the Western Conference Finals. Um, okay, the I Can Do Anything podcast. This episode is brought to you by Standard Process. Since 1929, Standard Process has been dedicated to the field of nutritional supplements and the whole food philosophy introduced by Dr. Royal Lee. With Standard Process supplements, you will discover just how resilient your body can be when given the proper nutrition. Standard Process supplements contain time-tested formulas with whole food ingredients that provide safe, effective, high-quality nutritional support available through healthcare professionals. Our products promote a better quality of life for our customers. Standard Process demonstrates commitment to the person by fostering the physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual health of customers and employees, the commitment to the product by emphasizing the importance of concentrated whole food ingredient sources and herbs in the product line. 
commitment to the process by ensuring the highest quality of in every stage of development from farming through shipping, commitment to the planet by utilizing environmentally safe farming, manufacturing, and business practices, and commitment to posterity by preserving and strengthening the company for all future generations. Visit standardprocess.com today. That's S-T-A-N-D-A-R-D p r o c e s s dot com today to get some great whole food supplements. Um, okay, so speaking of eating healthy, um, I had a funny little interaction last weekend uh, with a friend. I, we were in the grocery store about to do some grilling. We we're picking up some some burgers and some food to go along with the burgers, and I find it fascinating how almost like socially it's like a social norm that if you're going to eat with, I don't know if you're eating with somebody else, if you're the one that goes for the, like wants to get vet, especially if you're barbecuing and you're, if you're just grilling or something, like if you're the one that wants the vegetables and says, "Eh, why are we getting chips? Let's get some fucking cucumbers or some carrots or some broccoli. God forbid. You're the like weird one that's healthy. <laughs> I got questioned like, do you want chips or is that not healthy? Can we get some chips or is that not healthy? And I was just like, yeah, I mean, get some chips. I don't know. I guess I didn't really push to get vegetables either just because I'm still sort of battling with this like uh, – pushing like when to push against these social norms of not eating well it's amazing to me how ingrained in american culture it is to just shame people for eating healthy i get shit from a coworker nearly every day when he takes a look at my lunch that's filled with green things and vegetables and is almost entire like minus maybe a little bit of the dressing is probably the healthiest, just like the, one of the healthiest, health, healthiest things that you could ever eat. You can tell that this is uh, something I'm passionate about. I can't even speak. It's just amazing to me how ingrained in American culture it is to make fun of people who eat healthy. And then to just like, so, so at this, we, we grilled burgers and I got made fun of for having gluten-free buns, which even I think is fucking pussy. I hate the word gluten-free because it's been made so so like mainstream it's just such a mainstream like hey man kind of thing now you know (laughs) hey man are your buns gluten-free is that gluten-free is this gluten-free everything has gluten-free on it now but really it's not even about having like being allergic to gluten gluten is just something that we shouldn't put in our body. Gluten is literally just a thing that makes you feel full, but has no nutritional value to benefit your body. It's just something that goes into your stomach and sits there to make you feel full. And then it's digested really not all that well, more than likely you probably have diarrhea if you have uh, any kind of sensitivity to it, but for the mo- like, even people that that don't realize that they have a sensitivity to gluten, like the reason if you just have most people don't pay attention to what their shit looks like or what happens, they just kind of shit. They have diarrhea, and it's like ah, whatever, I pooped. You know, sometimes you have diarrhea, but no, that's because the fucking food you're eating isn't agreeing with your body. That's what it. That's like what it is. Our bodies don't agree agree with blue, with gluten, which is why all the food now says gluten free. And you know, it's a lot. It's mainly because it's 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 a marketable thing now. A lot of people are looking for things that don't have gluten in it. So if it says gluten free in big letters on it, that people are more likely to buy it, I guess. But I'm just amazed at you know how wanting to be healthy and wanting to put things that your body can turn into nutrients is like this we it's like this taboo thing you're like weird and like the odd one out and i never want to be like no i don't want to eat no i don't want chips why do you want chips i especially especially when it's a friend of my girlfriend who i don't really know all that well (laughs) and i don't want to like i just always uh, like i always have to 
decide whether or not like I want the confrontation. And in most cases, I, 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 I welcome it. And I kind of, I kind of enjoy making people feel uncomfortable by saying like, no, I don't want chips. That shit is terrible for you. And I, I really like to kind of like make people feel like shit for the way that they eat like shit. Um, but this particular scenario, I just kind of like didn't feel like making this friend be like, wow, your boyfriend is fucking crazy, which I definitely am like without question. But I don't know. It's interesting to kind of weigh um, which situations I'm going to cause a scene for lack of a better phrase. So I don't know. Um, I also have been really, uh, enjoying work lately. I've been in a bunch of classrooms ever since the kids got back, the fucking kids are back. And ever since the kids have been back, I have been really fucking busy and I'm doing it to myself. I mean, I, I don't necessarily have to do a lot of the things that I'm doing now. It just, um, if I didn't, like no one would ask me to, to email a bunch of professors and ask them if I can come to their classes and do a bunch of different testimonials with students to kind of build up a catalog of, of, uh, students, you know, saying various things about the university, talking about a lot of our points of pride and our talking points. But if in the future, if I didn't have a bunch of the footage projects that I'd be working on, I wouldn't have, you know, all kinds of different footage to choose from to insert into a project where, uh, you know, the script of a project or the script of a video says, and our professors work one-on-one -on -one with our students. If I didn't have a bunch of footage of that, I'd have to use the same footage over and over for that specific thing because that's something that we push, you know, all the time. That's like one of our biggest uh, selling points for the university is the uh, student to faculty ratio and our small class sizes and things like that. And that's, you know, the, the small community is like a really, really f a big focal point that the university sells to prospective students. And if I didn't have a bunch of very, you know, like a bunch of different professors with a bunch of different students who are diverse and not all white and white, white males and, and females, then they'd be like, Hey, there's only, you've only got one. So I guess I do, I guess I do have to do it because they'd more than likely eventually be like, listen, you've used that same clip over and over again. So I don't know. I've just been really enjoying being in classrooms and being around the students again. I really do enjoy the summers when there's nobody around. It's, it's very peaceful and I, I just do mostly desk work. Um, and it's just kind of very relaxing. I, I, I watch fucking Netflix and YouTube videos in one screen while I log and edit on the other screen. I'm very productive and I get a little bit of side entertainment. But right now I really haven't, the last like two weeks, I really haven't had any time for any of that because I've been in classes. I've been shooting student testimonials. I've been out at student activities. Uh, I went to the House of Representatives student government meeting that had all the well, it had one representative from every club or organization and from every fr uh, fraternity or sorority. And I spoke to those kids about just getting them to invite me to their events um, and notify me of when they have, you know, like community service things for, for fraternities and sororities off campus. I need a lot more footage of those kind of things and just getting them to maybe shoot some of their own footage for stuff that I can't be at. So it's been really fun just uh, being back around young people, uh, people that are a lot closer to my age than most of my coworkers. Um, and just being in classes is fun. It's, it's fun interacting with kids and seeing the different, uh, you know, activities that professors are doing in their classes and, and being outside a lot more. I'm, I'm hauling equipment around all over the place and getting exercise. And that's a, uh, something that I really, really enjoy about my job. One of the activities that I went to was the, we have a fellows program. It's like a, uh, students get recommended by professors, um, that are, they're either engineering or business students. Um, they get recommended by professors to be a part of this fellows program. And they basically are like ambassadors for the university. They, um, they're just people that are, you know, good kids overall, good character and, and good in the classroom. Um, and this fellows program, 
does a number of, uh, you know, activities and events on campus and off campus to be ambassadors for the university and to, um, you know, encourage other students to be engaged on campus, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the fellows did this thing with, uh, there's Japan students that are here for two weeks. Uh, so they like learned how there was, there was like several tables, maybe six or seven tables, uh, at the football hospitality suite. And it was like five American fellow students per table and then one Japanese student. So there was like six or seven Japanese students. They all were at a table and they were basically teaching the American, uh, students how to speak Japanese and all of it was in, in Japanese. Like they spoke Japanese almost the entire time. It was really cool. So they taught them how to make sushi and how to like roll their own sushi entirely in Japanese. They taught them how to like say their name and introduce themselves. But, you know, by saying like where they're from and their major and all this stuff, it was really cool uh, just to see these kids interacting with the Japanese students. Uh, those fellows are really like really engaged people. Like you can just see it in their eyes uh, when they're talking to people. A couple of the, a couple of them in particular who I've done videos uh, with in the past that are you know when we find students that are good on camera, we kind of latch onto them and use them for a lot of different stuff. But you can just see it in their eyes when they're they're very engaged. They they they're great communicators. They're they're interested in what the other people the other person is saying, and they're quick learners too. Like I was amazed. Uh, at how fast these kids were able to like say hello my name is blah 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 in Japanese I was trying to do it sort of while I was filming and while I was just listening along and I kept forgetting how to say it within seconds of saying it to my yeah, I was kind of like muttering it quietly to myself behind the camera because I don't use really any of the audio. I'm just mainly shooting stuff like this for B-roll. Um, but it was a really cool event. I got some great footage. Um, it's, it's interesting. I, I like, I'm always like kind of looking for like very particular things. I have like, I, I, I know what all of our selling points are and I'm, lo I'm always looking for footage to kind of complement that. We're always looking for diversity. We're always looking for people smiling. We're always looking for a good mix of male and female. We're always looking for the, like I mentioned, the, the uh, student to faculty ratio. So any like small groups, anything where people are moving around, interacting with each other, doing hands-on stuff with, with lab equipment, or, you know, I was in a business class that was using monopoly money and water bottles to simulate, uh, like a supply and demand and like a demand curve. And, you know, so they, so one side of the room got six water bottles per person and the other side of the room didn't get any. And then both sides of the room got monopoly money. They all got the same amount of money and then they had to go around and barter basically, or like bar, uh, like, uh, what is that word argue or uh banter back of wow i cannot think of the word they had to go back and forth with people and, and try to uh you know like i'll sell you two water bottles for a dollar or i'll sell you three water bottles three water bottles for a dollar fifty or whatever it was and then they and then they like had a competition sort of to see like who ended up with the most amount of water bottles or the least amount of water bottles or who ended up positive based on, you know, the value of the water bottles and the, how much money they ended up with. It was, a, it was a cool activity that I got some good footage of, but, um, yeah, I'm really enjoying my work as of right now. I really enjoy being busy and, and not just sitting at my desk thinking about a bunch of stuff. I also got a clean bill of health this week. My blood samples came back extremely, extremely perfect. Almost every like, well, it was everything. He said, this tells me that this is good. This tells me that this, almost everything. I, I did a full blood sample for basically everything. And the doctor said that all of it was damn near perfect. So that was, that really helps the anxiety. Um, <laughs> at least for now, I know that I am an extremely, extremely healthy young individual. I rode my bike to work um, on yesterday, on Friday. Um, and that introduces me to a new segment on the podcast called the thrill of the week. <laughs> so my thrill of the week was riding my bike to work in the complete dark, uh, in the morning. So I rode my bike from, I think I left the house at 
five thirty a.m. and arrived on campus at like six oh six p.m. It was like six point four or six point five miles or something like that, and I was amazed at how dark it was. I, I kind of didn't expect it to be as dark as it was, and it was really kind of a thrill. I was like, I felt like I was in a movie. Like there were certain parts of the road where it was like extremely dark and other parts where it was lit pretty well. And anytime that a car would go by, you know, coming down the right side, as I'm riding the bike down the right side, I would move over to the left side and, you know, so that they could always see me because of the, uh, you know, it's because it's dark and their headlights were, most of them probably had their brights on until they saw me and then they'd flick their brights off. Um, but I'd be on the other side of the road. Not once were there a car, not once was there a car coming in both directions where I had to like be worried about staying on the right side and being on the shoulder because most of the roads I was riding on didn't have very much of a shoulder at all. Um, so I was riding in the grass on occasion, uh, especially on my way home when it wasn't dark. Uh, I was riding in the grass a lot more because, well, I took a different route on the way home. Uh, there's really only about two ways that you could go. Um, but yeah, I, it was a really, it was just an interesting experience. Uh, it was just kind of like a, a I, I wasn't uh, extremely worried about my safety. Like I knew that if there were two cars coming in both, both directions at the same time that I'd just get off the road completely and stop riding because there weren't very many cars in the morning. So I knew that, you know, if it did happen, I could just get off the road, stop riding. I wasn't really in a rush. So I got to work or I got to the MTI center at 606. So it took me about 36 minutes to go, whatever that is, six point some odd miles. Um, and then I worked out a shot for like an hour and then went to work, had a nice, uh, work day and then rode home in the afternoon. Um, and made some dinner with my lovely woman and went to sleep really early to come where I'm currently at the radio station, um, to do the morning radio. I think for next week's thrill of the week, I think I'm going to end up in a strip club tonight. <laughs> uh, it's my girlfriend's oldest or one of her older sister's birthday today, I think, or this weekend. Um, so we're going to go out in Fort Wayne and celebrate with her. I am more than likely going to be the designated driver for the weekend. Cause I really have no interest in drinking. Um, but the sister of hers is a heavy drinker and I could see us ending up in a strip club based on, um, what I've heard about this sister and, um, yeah, I've never, well, I've been to a strip club once I was in a strip club in Europe. Uh, but it was more, it was a very high class strip club. It was like you walked in the, it was in Prague. You walked in the, the main floor was a restaurant and then the top four or five floors were a hotel. And then there was a, the floor below the main floor was a nightclub. And then the floor below that was a strip club. So it was like a, it was like a hotel restaurant, nightclub, and strip club all in one. It was like a four in one building, um, a really cool place. The, the nightclub was really awesome. And then the strip club was, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, again, it was very high class. I don't anticipate the place that we go to in Fort Wayne tonight. If we go, which I sort of, I like part of me doesn't want to go because I know that we'll more than likely end up in a pretty ghetto ass place in Fort Wayne that probably won't be the safest place in the world. Um, and I don't necessarily want to be put in that situation, but another part of me could say like, Hey, that's part of life. Part of life is having a great little thrill every once in a while. And more than likely, nothing bad's going to happen. I'll probably have some great laughs and it'll be a fun experience that I can talk about on the, I can do anything podcast. So I'm, I'm interested. I'm, I'm excited either way. Um, but that'll more than likely be next week's thrill of the week. Thank you for listening to the, I can do anything podcast today brought to you by fluorescent things. What an opportunity my listeners have uh, everyone needs a little bit of light in their life. And in my professional career as a videographer, I could always use a fluorescent light or two. Fluorescent Things is my go-to online store for all things fluorescent, whether it's your standard overhead light, photo or video lighting, commercial lighting for you biologists, providing the sole source of food generation for all living organisms on the earth. Shout out to Addison Dobb or Simple 
lighting for your home, maybe for a reading nook, work desk, or even construction site with various fixture types, sizes, bulbs, shapes, even a repair department. Fluorescent things will fill your life with light. They even have really random obscure things like hats with fluorescent lights, fluorescent lighting for your bike tires, which I could have used. It would have been really awesome, actually, uh, for my bike ride in the, in the dark, which I think I'm going to continue to do. Um, I really liked the exercise that that provided. I can't do it very frequently just because of my uh, evening work schedule here at the radio uh, in the early week. Um, fluorescent Lights is the largest fluorescent sales company in the world, and our listeners can get a 25% discount if you use the promo code THINGS at checkout. That's promo code T-H-I-N-G-S at the time of purchase for your 25% off. Thanks again for listening to the I Can Do Anything podcast brought to you by Fluorescent Things. Have a great rest of your week i will be back more than likely in a week uh potentially during the week this pat this this upcoming week but more than likely it'll just be on saturday have a safe labor day weekend uh peace <laughs>